Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and with me today I have my friend, Dr. Carolyn Copenhaver, who is a faculty member at Virginia Tech in the Forestry Department. We're going to be talking about topography, and we're going to be going on an excellent hike here on the Appalachian Trail near Blacksburg, Virginia. We're going to be hiking on a spur ridge of Brush Mountain, just like the ones you see in the background here. You can also see at this time of year, the hardwoods have not leafed out and appear to be gray, while the pines are dark green. We'll be learning more about this alternating pattern and smaller scale differences caused by topography. So our first stop here is in a valley. This is a relatively flat area that was farmed in the past. And most of the flat areas in Virginia were farmed, whether that's the valleys out here in the mountainous area or the places that aren't ravines, maybe in the uh, eastern or northern part of the state. And you can see here there's a lot of pine trees. We have some white pine and we also have some dying Virginia pine. So pine trees are an early successional species, something that will come in um, right after agriculture, especially that Virginia pine is very tolerant of soils that have been depleted by agriculture, but it's also relatively short-lived. A Virginia pine is only gonna live for maybe 70 years. And these are experiencing age-related mortality um, because they probably arose um, you know, slightly more than 70, maybe 70 to 100 years ago. So we're talking uh, land abandonment that occurred around the time of the Great Depression. And as these Virginia pine trees um, die out, they're being replaced um, with, with the white pine and also with some hardwood trees, as you can see um, here and on the other side of the trail, there's a lot of hardwood. Now we're in a bottomland forest. You can see that we are in the floodplain of Craig's Creek. And over here is where the Appalachian Trail, the one we were just on, crosses Craig's Creek. And a floodplain is an area where the soil tends to be um, deeper and also moisture conditions, both of which are beneficial to trees, but also an area that can often be disturbed by flooding and where the soil is sometimes scoured away as you see over there where Carolyn is standing, the soil has been washed away from those trees and their roots. And here are some species that are very typical of a bottom land. This is mussel wood, um, called because the bark has this sort of muscular, sinewy look to it. It's a very small tree, um, understory species. There's another one. And then over here, this tree that's leaning with all of the wonderful moss on its bark is a sycamore tree. Sycamores are um, known for their ability to withstand um, flooding. That's something else you have to be able to do here in the floodplain is um, tolerate flooding. All right, so we are at one of my favorite topographic positions, which is a cove. And so a cove goes up on either side and usually has a little stream of water running in the middle of it. So you can see that stream right there. And so coves are characterized by being moist and cool because the cool air drains down from the sides. And so historically, these areas were dominated by eastern hemlock. And the log that's right behind me here was a former eastern hemlock. And a majority of the eastern hemlock in this area died in the late 2000s because of an invasive insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so these coves are a really interesting place to see transition of what's going to be coming in next. Historically, these really shade canopy covering eastern hemlock kept the sun out of these areas. And if you look, there's a ton of sunlight in here now. And so starting to pay attention to who's going to follow those eastern hemlock is what's, what's going to happen in coves in the next few years. It's an interesting topographic position to watch.
So we've come up a ways out of that bottomland area and out of that protected cove area. And we are now walking up this ridge, along this ridge, and we are on a north facing slope. So this slope gets light mostly in the morning. It's not a hot beating sun that causes a lot of evaporation. And so this is an area that's dominated by hardwood trees. So I'm here on that northeast facing slope and I'm sitting on the slope. You can see the slope behind me. I'm facing the same direction that the slope is facing. I'm facing northeast. In fact, I have my compass here. So here's my compass and you can see uh, where north is and east and that we are facing more or less northeast as we are sitting on this slope. So the slope is facing northeast and that's what we call aspect. The aspect of the slope is northeast. So now we've come around the, to the other side of that ridge that we were on and this is a south and west facing, southwest facing ridge. And this is the side that's going to get a lot of that hot afternoon sunshine, which is going to cause a lot of evaporation, causing the soil and also the leaf litter and other materials to be very dry. And this side of the ridge is going to be much more phone, prone to fire. And you can see that it is mostly all pine growing on this side of the ridge. We'll shoot up so you can see the pine. So pines are a very fire tolerant and sometimes even fire dependent species. And in the understory, it's really hard to see here in front of me because there's no leaves on it. But close in front of me, we have some blueberry bushes, low bush blueberry. And then of course, a little farther away, we have uh, mountain laurel. And so these are our understory species, which are also um, really very tolerant of fire and of the generally drier, hotter conditions that we find on the southwest facing side of the ridge. So we are in a saddle position right now. We're heading up a spur ridge towards the main ridge that's up there. And this is a section where that spur ridge line goes down just like a saddle. So it goes up on the tail and up on the head. And any of you that hunt white-tailed deer know that a saddle is a perfect place to find white-tailed deer in the cold winter because it's sheltered from the wind. So it tends to be a little bit warmer. And that warmer condition also brings you slightly different tree species. And so it's a little bit more fertile, a little bit more sheltered, and you'll get some higher quality timber growth there. So now we've come back around to that southwest facing slope again. You can see all of the pine and also some kind of scruffy looking chestnut oaks and things. Um, pretty typical for uh, upland ridge top type situation dry soil and whatnot. And um, here on this pine tree, you can see a fire scar. So here's a scar where a fire burned this tree. And fire scars are most common on the uphill side of trees like this because um, there's often an accumulation of leaves and other debris that have rolled down the hill and piled against the trunk there. And as the fire comes up the hill, it'll wrap around the tree and you'll have higher flame heights actually on the uphill side of the tree. And so you get a fire scar like this. It's hard to see, but there is one on that uh, smaller pine tree behind this one as well. So as you can see, we're very near the top of this spur ridge, not the highest ridge around here, but the, the highest ridge that we're probably going to see today. And ridge tops tend to have very thin soil. So you can see there's just almost no soil here at all. It's just rocks almost right on the surface, a little bit of thin sandy soil up here. 
because the soil washes downhill. Um, and so you end up with thinner soil up here and um, lower fertility, less organic matter in the soil. So this here is a reindeer lichen, reindeer lichen, and this is so dried out it's falling apart, but that's an indicator of really poor soil. Um, wherever you see that, you probably have a low fertility soil for whatever reason. In this case, it's because of um, slope position. So now we are just a little ways away from where we saw all of those fire scars on the pine trees and we still have a very um, fire prone type of ecosystem here. We still have a lot of the uh, low bush blueberry and mountain laurel and other species that do really well. And we also have these chestnut oaks and you can see that this chestnut oak has three, uh, maybe four because there's that short dead one, uh, sprouts, stumps coming out of one spot. And this one over here, oops, this one over here also has uh, three, um, plus a, a little red maple decided to grow in there too. Um, this, in, in this setting, we're seeing the stump sprouting because of fire. So a fire came through here and top killed um, an existing chestnut oak, and then it re-sprouted from the stump. And often when you see um, situations like this where you have multiple trunks, it is because something has top killed a stem which has been sprouted back from the roots. In this case, fire, you'll also see this in areas of timber harvest where the trees have been um, severed for harvest. And this is also a really good way of naturally regenerating a hardwood forest. Uh, pines don't do this, but uh, most of our hardwoods do, including our oaks. This is called coppice regeneration. When it comes back from the stump, that's called coppice. Okay, so we've been hiking up the spur ridge and Karen showed you last that southwest aspect. Now we're back over on that northeast aspect. And that means all of a sudden we're getting that early morning sunshine. And in the winter time, that really matters because we get a lot of ice storms in the Appalachian Mountains. And so if you look at the tree above me here, the form is terrible. It has so many broken branches and it's all about ice damage. And so these trees have very little timber value. And it's all along this northeast aspect up here, all these ice damaged trees. Um, we've actually cored some of these trees and they go back to the early 1700s. And it's because nobody wanted to harvest them because the ice damaged the shape of the trees to such an extent. So we are here on the most beautiful early April day, and you can see here that the service berry is blooming. We saw a service berry in the Nature Walk 15 minute video I did about a year ago, um, but this is it in the wild, and I just think it's one of the most beautiful spring trees. When we first saw it, for a moment, we were afraid that we had come upon a cattle repair, but you can see all of these beautiful tiny little white flowers just a beautiful, beautiful, small native tree. And now we're gonna come down and learn about the Table Mountain Pine, which I have not seen in 20 years, you know, living in the eastern part of the state. But um, Carolyn is gonna tell us about the Table Mountain Pine. So we have to look pretty hard to find ourselves one of these cones because the trees really hang on to them. And one of the reasons they hang on to their cones so long is they are serotonous, meaning that they'll close up, keep the seeds nightly, nicely tucked inside with a waxy coating on the outside. And then when a fire comes through, it will melt that waxy coating and the seeds are dispersed onto that newly burned mineral soil. And so Table Mountain Pine is just a really nice fire follower species with that adaptation of the serotonous cones. And within the Appalachian Mountains, there's actually two types of Table Mountain Pine. So at the top of the ridges where fires were really quite frequent, all of the trees are serotonous. And here at the middle part, we don't have as much serotony because fire was less frequent. And so you get a mixture of serotonous and non-serotonous at the mid elevations. And the high elevations, higher frequency of fire, everything's serotonous. So it's just a really nice local adaptation for this tree. Table Mountain Pine. Thank you for joining me for this week's 15 Minutes in the Forest. 
please come back and join us next week and every week that we have 15 minutes in the forest.